Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books in History podcast, part of the New Books Network. I am your host, Christoph Odinitz, and today our guest is Virginia Postrel, a journalist, author, and independent scholar. She's a columnist for the Bloomberg Opinion and has been a columnist for The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. She's the author of The Substance of Style, The Power of Glamour, and The Future and Its Enemies. Today, we're talking about her newest book, The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. Virginia Postrel, welcome to New Books in History. It's great to be with you. You write, we hairless apes co-evolved with our cloth. From the moment we're wrapped in a blanket at birth, we are surrounded by textiles. They cover our bodies, bedeck our beds, and carpet our floors. Textiles give us the seat belts and the sofa cushions, tents, and bath towels, medical masks, and duct tape. They are everywhere. Reading your words, I enjoyed the wonder of looking again at something so ubiquitous and so central to the human experience that we don't even see it. A fish doesn't know it's wet. So could you please summarize the argument and the spirit of your book for us? And I would just like to add that um, I wrote that question before I finished the book, so I was very happy to see in your afterward why textiles that you described your own wonder in the face of this ambitious and exciting project. So what I'm trying to do in The Fabric of Civilization is actually two complementary things. One is to overcome our textile amnesia. I have this line in the book about we suffer textile amnesia because we have textile abundance. Uh, Only in the last 100 years or even the last 50 years has cloth become so inexpensive and whether it's clothing or or home goods or whatever, that we really take it for granted. And we don't think very much about where it comes from or how it's made. Um, So I wanted to restore some of the wonder to the process, whether it's how did we get quote unquote natural fibers, which aren't in fact natural at all. They required a great deal of, of human artifice to create to what's going on with weaving, where do dyes come from? How does that affect the chemical industry? And and that leads to the second aspect of the book, which is using the lens of textiles to give us insights into the history of humanity, the global history of, uh, of humanity, and particularly the history of innovation and uh, ingenuity and in, in its sort of economic, technical, and uh, scientific forms, but also in some of its co- social and cultural uh, institutional forms. So you say uh, what we usually call the Stone Age could just as easily be called the String Age. Would you take us from the beginning uh, when the hairless apes first uh, started <laughs> tying rocks to sticks and what happened? Yeah. So first of all, one of the interesting experiences I had as a writer was in the very short period, about six weeks uh, between when I submitted my first draft of the manuscript and when I had to revise it and and resubmit it, um, a paper came out that took the earliest string back from about 30,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago, and actually from Homo sapiens to Neanderthals. And uh, a string is a super important technology. And by string, I mean essentially taking some plant fibers and twisting them so that you have something long and strong that you can use to tie things together, to uh, attach uh, an arrowhead to an arrow or a spear point to a spear, to carry a baby, to create nets, to set traps, all of these kinds of things that suddenly allowed humans of whichever variety uh, to expand their ability to survive in the natural environment that extended their hands, that extended their ability to carry, to throw, to forage for food, to store things. Uh, So string is an incredibly important, very, very early technology. 
one of the earliest, and it definitely is as early as stone tools. The big difference is stone tools survive. They don't rot, whereas <laughs> string is very, very rare uh, for paleontologists or anthropologists or archaeologists to find. Uh, and they have found some, and it, it's been pushed back farther and farther. Uh, but this is this captures not only the importance of textile technology, and string is not textile, string is just string, but it's the first step on, on, that, on that road. Um, and, but it also captures what is difficult about textiles, which is when we think about the history, especially the prehistory of textiles, our records aren't particularly good because textiles decay. And so we are he heavily reliant on cloth that's preserved in a few very special places on earth because mostly very dry places, although there are also some bogs and uh, places where there are anaerobic environments, and also on other kinds of records, on pictorial records. Uh, when you start to get writing, there are written records. But textile history uh, in its most ancient forms tends to get, tends to get a bit of short shrift simply because there's less surviving evidence. So, okay, so these Neanderthals started um, uh, tying one thing to another, and then there was uh, the Neolithic Revolution, and sometimes people call it the Agricultural Revolution, maybe 10, what was that, 10,000 years ago? And um, they start cultivating flax and, and cotton and so on. And what happens next? Right, so string is a cloth. To have cloth, you need a bigger supply and, and a more reliable supply. Um, and so you start to get in different parts of the world, different fibers being cultivated uh, in Europe and the Middle East uh, tends to be flax from which linen is made. Uh, sheep start to be bred, uh, not just for meat, but also for wool uh, in their in. There are four regions of the world where cotton is cultivated, uh, the Indus Valley, the, someplace in Africa. I realize Africa is really big, but it's <laughs> there, there's dispute about where exactly it started to be cultivated, uh, possibly the Horn of Africa, part, possibly Southern Africa, and then on the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, the coast of Peru. So you start to have these, and then there are other fibers like hemp and nettle and things that we tend to not think about today, but a lot of them are plant fibers and they are grown and cultivated with the idea that they will be used for textiles. So flax is first cultivated for oil from flax seeds. And this leads to having flax pods that don't open and spill all the seeds on the ground. But then once there's sort of cultivated flax, people start to say, you know, we can use this for fiber if we more easily, if we encourage taller stems that have fewer leaves. And so you get a sort of different flax varieties cultivated for oil versus for uh, linen. And this is the story of, it's the same story with wool, uh, you, sheep in their natural form are very hairy as opposed to fleecy <laughs> and that hair is hard to uh, spin into into good uh, thread uh, people start to encourage the the mating of the sheep that have fleecier coats and then over a very long period of time you get the kind of fleecy coats that we see in ancient artworks in Mesopotamia and that region, um, where they're, 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 it's not just a kind of hair that molds. It's something that you first pluck and later shear off. And, and you um, do a wonderful thing here because it's such basic technology that we should all know it. I've all, you know, when I was a child, I watched uh, Sleeping Beauty and I saw the spindle and the spinning wheel. And I remember the story about the woman who had to spin straw into gold and was perplexed by that. And I never had thought about it. And finally, in this book, I understand what it is to make thread. And it's amazingly difficult and, and 
and develop many places simultaneously or not simultaneously, but over, you know, the millennia. Would you explain how to make thread? (laughs) I'll try. (laughs) So basically all fibers are relatively short of flax would be one of the longer fibers. When you take it out of the plant, you might get two feet. Well, you can't do too much with two feet of thread. Um, And it's also not that strong. So what you want to do is twist the fibers together so that you can elongate them, get them to stick together, um, and also make them stronger. And you get this kind of friction that holds everything together. One thing you realize when you start studying uh, textiles is everything is about friction. It's all friction is holding everything together. It's holding the thread together. It's holding the cloth together. And anyway, so around the world, uh, people developed a common spinning technology. I mean, it had slight variations, but it's basically what's called a drop spindle. And it's essentially a stick for twisting the thread on with a weight at one end that conserves the angular momentum. So you can start this stick, you can twist a little bit of the fiber along the, at the top of the stick, you can start it spinning and then you can sort of feed it fiber and um, it get a longer and longer bit of string. And then wrap when it gets too long, like it reaches the ground, you wrap it around the spindle and you spin some more. And if this sounds hard, it actually is. <laughs> I've tried to do it. I, once people know how to do it, it's it becomes second nature and it's very meditative and all of this kind of stuff. But it's actually really hard to get the tension right so that you have this so that the string doesn't break, but it's also fine enough. And uh, and it takes a long time, even in the hands of a very adept spinner, where it looks like they're just doing it as if by magic, pulling it out of the air. It takes a long time to make usable amounts of thread to weave or potentially knit. Knitting is a later technology. And that's because the numbers are just staggering how much it takes to weave anything. Um, And I have calculations in the book, but I'll I'll share one that I did more recently. Take a bandana, standard bandana, 22 inches square. It's a small piece of cloth. There's a mile and a half of thread, or if you're on the metric system, about just short of two and a half kilometers of thread to make the cloth. This is not the thread that's for sewing. This is what you weave the cloth out of. It's sometimes referred to as yarn versus thread, but but it's the same thing. So you've got a mile and a half of cloth in there, and that would take about 24 hours to spin on an Indian charka, which was the fastest, it's a different spinning technology, it's a kind of spindle wheel. It was the fastest pre-industrial revolution spinning technology. So when you start to realize that to make a 22-inch square bandana, it would take 24 hours of fast spinning, you realize why the Industrial Revolution was such a big deal. Why having machines that would spin thread rapidly was transformational uh, because then you all kinds of cloth become more affordable. And the other thing is, before the Industrial Revolution, women in all cultures spent all their lives spinning. They were just spinning all the time. And that's why we have these fairy tales. And that's why we have this idea of spinning straw into gold as kind of the source of fantasy wealth. Um, it, It was a central and almost unremarked upon part of life. It was like cooking or cleaning. It was something everybody did, everybody had to do. And uh, whether it was in order to clothe their uh, household, whether it was because they were doing it for money, whether it was because they were doing it to pay taxes, uh, it was something that was universal uh, because there was always a need for more thread. I was very much struck by your chart on page 49 that says I need six miles of thread to make a pair of jeans. I need 60 miles of thread to make 
a sale and it takes over a year of, if it were just one person, it would take a year to make such a thing. Right. I bet there's a lot of women doing it. I bet it's communal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. if you have, so a Vikings, a Viking sale took longer to make than a Viking ship, which is amazing. Um, and that includes not just the spinning and the weaving, but also plucking the sheep and cleaning the wool and all of that sort of stuff. But yes, it definitely, when you say it would take a year, it wouldn't be one person. It would be a communal activity. And very rarely do you have uh, a single sale. You're going to have multiple sales. So um, that is a uh, an issue too. <laughs> so when you start to think about these fleets, these pre-industrial fleets, not just in sort of the Viking fleets, but even uh, later in the 16th and 17th century, you have uh, large ships and ships are incredibly important. Those sails represent a significant part of the labor involved in making the ship. It's not just the wooden parts. Yeah. I'd, um, I, I would like to add for our listeners that as I was reading this, I frequently went to YouTube to yes. look up Spindle Whorl, 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 I'm not sure. Spindle, Spindle Whorl, Whorl, yeah. Whorl with an O. And just, there are so many artisans who in three minutes on YouTube will show you how it's done. It really, it's 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 a wonderful companion for this. And then also the harvesting of silk. I Just to imagine how, you know, those cocoons were spun off into. Um, yes, into yes, things. the silk reeling, which is when you have the, you take the silk cocoons, and each silk cocoon is one long fi- filament that's wrapped in, and, and to turn that into thread, you put them in w- hot water that sort of degums them. They're sticky, and that, yeah. that kind of melts the gum. And then you have this very delicate, precise process of taking those, taking that one strand out, and then combining it with one or more other strands, and then that gets. Uh, reeled onto a horizontal reel. And it, it's the women who did this, I write about this in, in, in that chapter, the, the women who did this in the silk factories of Northern Italy were extremely well paid uh, by the standards of the day and more than many men uh, because it was such a skilled profession. And a, luxury, and a luxury material. So it was very valuable what they were doing. Right. And in contrast, just the common women in villages who were doing this from morning till night, you you, you talk about the, um, maybe it was Aztec or maybe it was Tlaxcala, little girls at the age of four, they had to, you know, uh, continually spin or they'd get, you know, beaten severely with thorns because it was so central to the Right. The yeah. So that the- was, yes. So it was, the Aztecs were demanding tribute. So they were the conquerors. And I, I'm actually not sure whether it was Tlaxcala or what exactly the the people were who were doing this. But yeah, the Aztecs demanded enormous amounts of tribute of cloth, of, of cloaks and cloth and from cotton. And so the, uh, the people in the villages had to produce this, which meant they had to spin and then weave uh, and dye uh, these materials. Uh, and they themselves used a much cruder, they didn't wear cotton themselves, they, they used um, a much cruder kind of fabric. Um, but this was, and this was typical, it was very common in, in different parts of the world for conquerors to levy tribute or just for rulers to levy taxes. Uh, in the for- form of textiles. And of course, you can't really say no to those guys. <laughs> so that's why from a very early age, the uh, the mothers were punishing the daughters if they didn't spin well, because that was an essential life skill. Right. And so uh, just so much work and so continuous. And probably, you know, it's not, it's just communal. So it's not it's not paid, but I, I I love the passage where you where you remark how many of the terms the the the, the words have passed into um, our English word. Like for example, a spinster is a is is a usually not the most positive term for an older unmarried lady, right? But that's right. probably because she's at home spinning all the time. 
just to get by or right you know. exactly because there people did spin for money and that was a, and and depending on the period sometimes spinning paid better than other times uh, but it it was yeah that was the idea a spinster is a person who spins and then it came to mean an unmarried woman uh, because one way that an unmarried woman was likely to support herself was by spinning yeah, and then you uh, let's talk about weaving next. But so many of those terms are, if I may, woven into our you know into our speech. And you have so many examples of um, um, the shuttle, right? The shuttle is a is a bus or a ship that goes back and forth, but it's also part of a loom. Or if I'm replying on the internet, I might reply to a thread. Or if I'm telling a joke, I'm spinning a yarn or uh, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's throughout our language. Um, there are also things that where people don't even realize it, like if you're on tenterhooks. Uh, nobody knows what tenterhooks are. I've actually seen some in museums. but uh, And this was a way, there are these really vicious-looking metal hook uh, spikes that wet wool would be stretched, uh, wool and cloth would be stretched on after it was... Uh, woven and then fold, which involves applying friction and, and water to it to sort of felt it so that it's thicker. And, uh, and they would be stretched on these tenter hooks. And so that, that sense of being on tenter hooks is this, you know, being kind of nervous and anxious and waiting for something to happen. That's that sense of this wool cloth that's been stretched tight. So, so now we have this thread and we have to turn it into something. Now we have to weave it, right? It's uh, the, on the loom, and um, and the, you have so many examples of looms from all all parts of the world. Uh, how did that work? Was that also women's work, or was that uh, artisanal kind of, you know, Mister Weaver in the village would make it, or how did it go? In that, unlike spinning, which is women's work almost everywhere, weaving it really depends on the time and place, and to some degree the technology. So some places like China, for example. It was stereotypically women's work. And so the idea was men farm and women weave. There were sayings like that. Um, in other places, most throughout most of uh, Europe, it was mostly but not exclusively men's work. Uh, certainly places where the guilds were very strong, they tended to limit themselves as much as possible to men uh, but there would often be widows of weavers or wives of weavers who are also weaving. And there's some thought that maybe that particular uh, gender division is based on the fact that the, the um, European looms were very heavy, um, although I think it was really more about men wanting to maximize their profits. But anyway, so and then there are places in Africa where women weave on one kind of loom and men weave on another kind of loom. So there, it really depends on time and place and the, the customs of the country. Okay, so you have the loom and it has a shuttle that goes back and forth and they make amazing designs. Uh, and they, they learn, they memorize patterns for threads and different colors of, of threads. Um, were, what, was, what was the process of discovery there? How did we find out about this or does it still exist? Oh, this still exists. Um, uh, there are certainly around the world uh, weavers who are weaving in traditional fashions. I, in the book, I talk about, for example, uh, a Lao weaver who's making brocades using a slightly adapted traditional technology. When I say slightly adapted, I mean she uses nylon strings to st uh, store the patterns, whereas you know, 100 years ago, she would have used probably bamboo rods, uh, but uh, but it is a traditional way of, of selecting uh, strings for for patterns. And people, I have to say, people find the uh, chapter on weaving the one where they most need YouTube videos uh, because it is very hard to explain this three dimensional process uh, without seeing it happen. But uh, the basics of weaving are that you have what are called warp threads that are held in tension. Uh, and you can think of them as either the uh, ver sort of the 
if you will, the y-axis, the, the vertical threads, if it's a vertical loom, uh, although it's often they're often horizontal. And then you have the weft threads, which are the ones that the shuttle carries back and forth. And you lift selected warp threads to make a gap, and you put the, the weft thread in that gap across. And this can be every other one, odd numbers, then back across every other one, even numbers, and that makes what's called plain weave and sort of the, the basic weave that everybody uh, uses all around the world. And then it can get more and more complicated. You can uh, have what are called heddles, which are a, sort of a third dimension, which lift selected warp threads, and they can be in a pattern like every other one or every third one or they can be individual. And that's where you get very complicated weaves like brocades. And that's what ultimately leads to the invention of the jacquard uh, attachment, which many people have heard of. It's often called the jacquard loom, which was a way of selecting individual threads, one row at a time with which threads those were uh, determined by holes in a punched card which then inspires various computing ideas down the road. Right. I remember the computers with punch cards that were so big and loud <laughs> in the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. And you have wonderful illustrations that show how that punch card catches or blocks a rod or a, or a little stick that then... Yeah. And it's so a very it's, complicated mechanism. And at the time it was invented, which was right at the turn of, of the 19th century, it was sort of the world's most complicated machine uh, in terms of the number of parts and the precision needed to, to make it. But it swept weaving because although it was originally designed to make complicated patterns like, you know, fancy birds and flowers for your extremely expensive wallpaper, uh, not paper, but wall, wall uh, textiles, um, it was quickly adapted because it's so efficient that you could even just weave plain weave more more quickly using that but this already changes everything because now you know this is a machine but first it was just artisans and people putting in so much hour hours of work and i want to share a story because i've often quoted to students um an example from from 16th century spanish fleets where um a certain hidalgo a gentleman died and then his clothes was auctioned off and it was auctioned off for a, a year's uh, pay for a sailor. And sailors were pretty well paid because um, it was dangerous work and there was lots of potential for ri riches. And if you die, they don't have to pay you. So, um, uh, But I, I always sort of like gave that story with a little trepidation, unsure if there had been a mistake. But now I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, a, a nice set of clothes was so precious. Uh, oh, yeah. If it was a gentleman's clothes, definitely yeah. that would yeah and so nobody had a lot of clothes right i mean people maybe rich people had a few outfits but a poor person walked around in a you know in a what in a in a hemp tunic and that was it and never changed it or um, right if... and and i mean you have in the 18th century um adam smith writing about how now in england as opposed to scotland actually if i'm remembering correctly um, to be respectable, a laborer should have a second shirt so that one can be one, you know, so that you can do laundry. Right. Basically. And that's, and that's the 18th yeah. century. That's fairly yeah. late. Um, yeah. It's pre-industrial revolution, but you have had a commercial revolution. Thing, you know, uh, right. The, 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 the spinning Ginny already exists and so on. There are factories at that point. It's kind of on the cusp of that. So it's, it's, but you're, um, the country is more prosperous. That's what the main thing, but the point is that's a second shirt. <laughs> you know, how many shirts do you have in your closet? Right. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and even as, even as late as the uh, 1930s, 1920s for a, a clerk, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to get this a little bit wrong because it's based on research I did for my 2003 book. So I'm pulling it out of my head. But there was a 
a survey done of the sort of living standards of workers in San Francisco in, I believe it was the late 20s. Um, and it was unusual for somebody who was, say, a clerk, which was a white collar, but sort of not super affluent profession, to have more than two suits of clothes. Uh, now, that's much fancier than a, a laborer uh, in say, 1600 would have, because we're talking about a suit. Uh, but still, it, this is in, you know, in the lifetimes of people who are alive today. Uh, that that would be unusual. Well, I also feel like in those older movies, uh, clerks and, and 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 men like that who had to have white clothing, like they would unpin the collar and unpin the cuffs and wash that, right? Right, like- right. And and that goes back uh, often that you're seeing the linen, like even in older portraits or whatever, you see little bits of white collars or white cuffs. Um, because those often were laundered separately and you could keep, you could have more of those and launder them separately. And also, you know, I don't write about this in the book, but laundry is an enormous time consuming process. And it is in fact, the first thing that people, when they get any money at all, they pay somebody else to do it. (laughs) And that's true to this day in a, in places where people don't have washing machines. If, if you have to be hand doing your laundry in, say, India, you if even a poor person might pay a poorer person to do their laundry. But you'd also want to be careful with that because it probably is the process by which clothes gets used up. Is uh, Yes, yes. It. So yeah. uh, um, that's a good segue into maybe you could explain to us um, about the, your chapter on dyes and how how people figured out and the amazing and elaborate ways people figured out to color their clothes. Yeah, so the, the sort of the theme of the chapter on dyes is that the history of dyes demonstrates both the power and the limits of trial and error experimentation without chemical knowledge. Because once you get modern chemistry, then there's a big leap forward. But yes, people have used all kinds of things to dye their clothes and we have we have uh there's there are fr- textile fragments with indigo dye going back 6200 years uh from peru and again that wasn't that's not the first time people did it that's the thing that actually survived so um so that's the same kind of colors that's in your blue jeans uh it's probably nowadays in your blue jeans is probably not from a plant but it's the same chemical um, and so people have used plants and animals, uh, to create all different kinds of colors. And many of them require not just the dye stuff, like, you know, for example, for red, the, the matter or the cochineal, which was this great red that grows on cactuses in, in uh, it's indigenous to, uh, Mexico, um, but you also had to have what was called a mordant or is called a mordant, which is from the word, the Latin word to bite, which is a chemical. It's usually some type of metallic salt. Alum is the most common. There are, le- uh, there are uh, tin mordants and uh, iron mordants. And that is something you treat the fabric with first or the fiber with first before you dye it and it makes the dye adhere better to the to the material and in some cases it won't adhere at all um, unless you use a mordant um and then protein fibers are easier to dye than cellulose fibers like cotton so silk and wool dye really easily excuse me cotton is really hard to dye so when indian cottons hit europe uh, they were a revelation because Indian dyers had developed really good ways of dyeing cottons and making them color fast. And when when was that? Because Europeans were didn't have cotton for a very long time. Well, they had some cotton. I thought they didn't have cotton until fairly late in my research, but they had some cotton, but it wasn't a major European fiber. Um, it there's more than one answer to that question. 
those Indian cottons first enter Europe in the 16th century via Portugal, but they really become a big deal in the early, starting in the early 17th century, uh, when you start to have trading by the British East India Company, the French East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, um, where they're bringing in large quantities of what were called calicos, which are these Indian prints, which are cotton, very finely spun Indian spinners were the best in the world at spinning cotton. And Indian textiles had been long exported uh, in the other direction to Southeast Asia, places like, and they would make special designs for the Malaysian market. Or uh, So now they're making special designs for the European market. Um, and so they were, it was this very lightweight, very washable um, fabric with color fast dyes. And compared to comparable European fabrics, it was also fairly affordable, uh, especially if you were talking about something with a design. Because before you had the Indian prints, European fabrics were not printed. Um, so the only way you could have like flowers on your dress was to embroider them. And that required silk thread, which <laughs> there are a lot of people in Europe who didn't have access to silk thread for some reason. Um, so now a serving girl could have a cotton kerchief or something like that, that little bits of this sort of fashionable, colorful and- um, and speaking of the dyes, they, uh, you have one quotation from a dyer who, who says the, the creation of indigo has, and I'm quoting, the ripe, sweaty, outhouse scent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then there's some made of mollusks, which I'm sure stinks also. Uh-oh. Yeah. The, so the, the, the mollusks, I, I, yeah, so I, in, I did dine with indigo um, and it does have this... <laughs> outhousey kind of smell. And when I did it, it was in a small workshop. Um, But you can imagine if you had large scale production that it would be very smelly. And this is one thing we often don't realize. We think natural dyes, well, they must be all environmentally groovy. Um, But actually the basic approach to dyeing has always been the same, which is to have it done somewhere else, <laughs> the outskirts of town, the other side of the world, wherever, because it tends to be a, a very smelly process and different dyes smell more or less worse than others. And it also requires a lot of water. So I, I do talk about the famous Tyrian purple, which was uh, uh, made from sometimes called royal purple, which was made from snails that live in in the Aegean and the Mediterranean. And I interviewed uh, an archaeologist who recreated that process. Um, She is, her name is Deborah Rochillo at uh, um, Washington University in St. Louis. And her specific area of expertise is faunal remains. So she studies bones and what can we learn from animal bones from the past? And she would see that there were these huge piles of these shells from dye production. And she wanted to understand how much did it take and what was involved in the process. And so she and a research assistant recreated the process, did an experiment to see uh, using Pliny's natural history, which is not, it turned out a completely accurate guide to doing it. And it was just awful. Um, You have all this rotting snail flesh and flies and smelly and really gross. And they were doing it in very small quantities. Um, And one of the things she decided is it must have been done by slaves because, um, it was just so awful. But one of the things that's interesting about this, that this was a dye that was used for very prestigious cloth in the ancient world, um, in, in later in the Byzantine Empire, it was actually limited to royal use, but earlier it was just very expensive. And one of the ways you could tell that somebody was wearing the authentic Tyrian purple cloth as opposed to 
an imitation that was dyed with, say, matter and indigo on top of each other to make a purple, was that even after it was washed and dried, it still smelled. So, so and it was a famous stinky thing that that uh, Roman writers like Marshall joked about that it was one of the bad smells in the ancient world, and yet it was this prestigious cloth. Well, that, that reminds me of the, the joke of, uh, I think it was Emperor Vespasian who was taxing uh, public bathrooms to collect urine uh, to make ammonia, to clean to clean the, you know, the togas and so on. And he said, money, you know, pecunia non olet, money doesn't, doesn't stink. So I guess business is yeah. his, his business. And there is, exactly. And there is a, a quote uh, from the historian geographer Strata that the people of of Tyre were very rich, but I don't, I'm not going to get it exactly right. It's in the book, but they're very rich, but nobody wants to live there because it's so awful, you know, so smelly. So it was a trade off. And definitely, I mean, mentioning collecting urine, this is something that is done throughout history, often in, to have the chemicals to use in dyeing. Right. Okay. So these people are rich and they're rich because they're trading this, right? This is Mediterranean right. training, Phoenicians, Byzantines. Um, this is probably going quite quite far. And you also explain the origins of the Silk Road, which was a road for trading silk. So um, the, tell us about how, how far these things went and how early they went. Yeah. So, well, as early as ancient Rome, you have Chinese silks. Um, now, we refer to the Silk Road, which is a 19th century term. Um, it was really a network of roads, and people didn't tend to trade from one. It, it's not like people were making journeys from China to Rome, the same people. There were stops along. So the, people, the goods would go through multiple <laughs> stages along, uh, along that path. But yes, people traded uh, the Phoenicians, who were, among other things, famous for their purple cloth, traded as far they were based in what's now Lebanon, and they traded and also had settlements as far um, away as the west coast of Spain. So that for the ancient world, that's pretty far. And then, of course, later on, you get really uh, people going all the way around the world with textiles. Um, but definitely you had, you had trade from India to Southeast Asia. You had trade uh, all across Central Europe from China, certainly from China to uh, what's now Turkey, um, which at one point was all under Mongol control. So that uh, led to a certain ability to trade. So, And we tend to think about... Uh, spices and gold as being the things that traded but textiles were always a big trade good um and also dyes and when when we think of spices we think of things like cinnamon and cloves but that term also encompassed a lot of dye stuffs so when people talk about trading spices they're often including things like indigo um which was traded from uh in India, hence the name, to Europe and eventually displaced the Euro the European native source of indigo, which is called woad, which is not as potent. And I also imagine that like spices, they have the great advantage of being compact, that you could take a small container of this and get rich. It's not like, you know, carrying ebony or something across great distances, yeah. which is just bulky. So the, yeah. um, I'm reminded uh, by Oscar Wilde's uh, joke when he saw Lady uh, saw saw Macbeth uh, and and he he wrote that uh, um, Lady Macbeth seems an economical housekeeper who evidently patronizes local industries for her husband's clothes and the servants' liveries, but she takes care to do all her shopping in Byzantium, right? So that's when it, <laughs> <laughs> like a medieval uh, that connection, you know, in whatever century yeah. Macbeth is yeah. supposed yeah. to be saying. Um, and and the. Uh, Byzantium was also a, a big source of alum for European dyers. So when Byzantium fell to the Turks, that was a catastrophe for the dyers uh, in Europe. Uh, but then 
uh, alum was discovered in the papal uh, states, and and next the uh, the pope tried to monopolize uh, and say that you would be excommunicated if you used alum from any other source. This is not in the book. This was on the cutting room floor, actually. But I did write an article about it. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so now let's we we have um, a steam power, and there are these looms and uh, factories that we imagine to be factories, and now there's cotton from. Uh, calico and so common people can now have more clothes and people's lives are improving in material ways that were not possible before um tell us a bit about that uh the that that industrial revolution and how a normal you know, factory worker might have a second shirt and yes so well there there's several aspects to it one is that because the amount of Going back to the spinning and how many, many hours it took by hand to spin, one result of that was that the way, even though the product was very important, the wages were necessarily very low because for any given hour, you weren't producing that much value. So we tend to think about these spinning mills as being horribly low paid. And by today's standards, they were. And of course, over the years, and particularly in the 19th century, there was a lot of labor activism in in, in the mills and, and such. But because they were so much more productive, the people who worked in the mills did make more than spinners would have made in the past. And then they fed into weaving, which those people could make more than they had in the past. Of course, then when power looms came out, some of those people lost their jobs, and then we had the Luddites. But um, but you do have this increase in productivity. Uh, explain explain just who, who these Luddites are. Okay, so we today we use the term Luddite as a general idea of people who are sort of against technology. The original Luddites were early 19th century weavers who smashed power looms and protested against the new technology of, of power looms out of not out of ideology <laughs> but out of self-interest they were in risk of losing their jobs uh, the the irony there is that the reason they had these for the for the period good jobs was that an earlier, technology, the spinning machines, had put other people out of work, uh, but had been allowed to go forward and eventually raised the standard of living for everybody. Um, the So you get this, the history of textiles reveals something that's true about technology and often in general, which is that you, it often has short-term disruptive difficult effects and long-term positive effects. Uh, the other, aside from increasing productivity and therefore raising wages, the big deal about having spinning, having inexpensive cloth is not just that you can have more shirts. It's also that cloth is used in lots and lots of parts of life. And especially in the world before plastics. So it's used for sacks. It's used for sales, not just plastic baby. Um, so if you're if you're outfitting ships in the 19th century, the fact that you can weave better sails that will also improve the quality uh, faster makes it much easier to build ships and to trade uh, and to travel. And that's going to have ripple effects on immigration patterns. Uh, you have these ripple effects throughout all of society because textiles are so ubiquitous. You have um, a, a, a sar- no, I don't know how to say it, maybe a, a, a satirical print of a woman called the St. Giles Beauty uh, from the 19th century. And clearly she's you know, sort of like a down on her luck prostitute but she has this nice cotton dress and then the more i look at the poster i realize she also has drapes and she also has stockings 
And she also has all these other things that are you know, made of, of fabric around her you know, apartment with its broken windows and dilapidated yeah. conditions. Yeah, so that, w- that print is from actually from the late 18th century. Um, probably, pr- it may even be pre-industrial revolution, but it's right at that cusp. And it is definitely in the period where you're starting to get cotton imports from India and, and and that sort of thing. So yeah, you start to have ordinary people having what by our standards is no big deal, but unprecedented amounts of fabric available to them that allows them to have more pleasure, to express themselves. And then there's just the practical things, stay warm, uh, have clean bed clothes, that sort of thing. And your book is not called The History of Textiles, but The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. And one of the uh, things that I was most impressed by is how what I would consider as um, you know banking, banking was started by, by uh, weavers. So for example, the famous Fuggers in Augsburg were weavers too. And this uh, fellow... Meyer Lehmann, who is who we would pronounce Lehman, he oh, also right. was he was a cotton a cotton middleman, right? And you have uh, perhaps my favorite sentence. You write here in brief is what middlemen do: they build a bridge between today and tomorrow, and they charge a toll. So yeah, speak <laughs> speak a bit about what is this civilization? Well, I think of civilization as all of the things that we develop institutions, habits, stories, technologies, uh, ways of understanding the world, whether that's science or religion, all of these things that stand between us as vulnerable human beings and hostile nature and also other other human beings. And it's cumulative. Um, it, it builds over time and unless there's a break. Um, and so you can have major cultural shifts, but the continuity of civilization. So the example I use for that is if you think about Europe in say 1480, it's completely different from Europe in 1980 in terms of its culture, in terms of its knowledge of science, its its knowledge of geography, its religious beliefs, its political practices. It's uh, the relationship between men and women, the, the economic, the nature of the economy, all of these things. And yet there's a continuity that's built on that cumulative uh, changes over time. And that's the constant of the civilization. And a big part of that are what I call in the book, social technologies. That's a term I took from other people, but, and those include a lot of things like banking systems or, mail service or the alphabet, uh, things that allow us to function uh, peacefully, hopefully, with other human beings, often over long distances. And much of that is driven by textile trade, particularly in the history of Europe, so that you have the banking systems developing new types of finance, uh, financial instruments, as well as even learning how to do arithmetic with Arab, Hindu Arabic numbers and uh, the first schools uh, that taught that and, and handbooks that taught that. Um, you also have in, in sev- one of the little interesting things I came across is in several independent places in the world, textiles were actually used as money by which I do not mean used in barter. I mean, it had all the characteristics of currency, standard sizes, uh, exchange, standard values. And this happened in medieval Iceland. It happened in uh, West Africa in the trade between sort of West Africa and what's now Libya. Uh, It happened in parts of China. Uh, So textiles, you could actually make money. Uh, make your money, weave your money. Uh, and money is an incredibly important social institution. And also credit, because these weavers credit, had, uh, um, what, 
what's the term? It's um, bills of exchange. Uh, bills, bills of exchange, of exchange. which happened in the Renaissance Italy. And even earlier, I learned from you in China with something called Fei Tian or flying money. Flying money, yeah, which I don't know a whole lot about. I just know it did exist. Um, yeah, and so this was a way that you could move money from between geographically distant places without actually hauling gold or silver or whatever was used as currency. It was a way of, I mean, we would think of it as checks. It's not exactly like checks, but it's a way that you would have, uh, you could write a note to a bank and uh, another note to another bank and have them swap. And and so I could pick up the money and, and my end of things. Um, and this was a, a very efficient way of moving money around, much more efficient, especially when you think about highwaymen and such than actually hauling the uh, specie. And it also, over time, became these would become negotiable. And so it became, in particularly in places where cash was a little short, became a form of money. People would just exchange these, pass them down. Um, and it only really disappears when you start to have central banking, and that's very late. So I know we have to, we have to stop, but I, I want to ask you about um, the the present and uh, there's there's two questions and I'll ask them both and you can take them how how you wish. Uh, one is the idea that um, in the internet age I can buy any kind of special uh, item I want, right? It, and you call this the long tail, uh, and you have an example of if you want a certain you know film curtains with yellow polka dots and you can't find them, s- someone will print that fabric for you and there's enough people in the world who want exactly that that that'll happen. And I've had that experience where. My my daughter was reading Little House on the Prairie, and she wanted a pioneer girl dress for Christmas. And for not very much money, we found someone on Etsy who makes pioneer girl, you know, 19th century dresses, and we could give that to her, and that was easy. But the other question I have is um, the flood of uh, clothes everywhere. And uh, 15 years ago, when I was a, a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, for one dollar, which is about a thousand. West African francs, I could buy a t-shirt in the marketplace, which is two days, two days labor, right? Or uh, for the poorest farmer can buy a cotton t-shirt, which, you know, in, in uh, 500 years earlier, we, we, we just said would take months, months of spinning and, and all of that. And so there's all this clothes everywhere. Um, what do you, th- what do you think about, what do you think about the, the present? What do you think about that? Well, for that, you need to read a different book. Which is my my friend Adam Minter has a wonderful book called Second Hand, which is all about the global trade in secondhand clothes, secondhand electronics, all of this abundance. Um, and he travels the world, and I can't. Re- it's it's very well written and very well researched, and I can't recommend it highly enough. So it's called Second Hand. It's by Adam Minter. Um, Right now, we are the cutting edge of a lot of textile research is oriented toward environmental issues. And it is, you could think of it as being about the problems of abundance rather than the problems of scarcity. Um, How do you, uh, for example, dyes are much less environmentally problematic today, probably per piece of dyed cloth than they've ever been. But the quantities are so great that the spillover effects are are enormous so that you need to think about how do you control those? How do you use less water? How do you, what do you do with the effluent? All of that sort of thing. Um, But I think that part of appreciating where textiles come from makes you think about, first of all, to count your blessings coming up on Thanksgiving. Maybe that's a good thing to think about all the textiles that you enjoy and also perhaps to use and care for them a little more respectfully. And I think it is a great thing that people in Africa or wherever in in, uh, poor, poor parts of the world have the opportunity to share in this abundance um, and to 
whether it's to protect themselves or the utilitarian aspects of clothing, bed clothes, et cetera, or it's just to express their personality, their identities. Uh, we have a great opportunity to do that. And uh, textiles are a big part of that. Thank you very much, first, for participating in New Books in History. And thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me, and especially for this excellent, excellent book. Thank you.